WFSU-FM now presents a delayed broadcast of the Economic Club of Florida luncheon meeting of September 20th, 2016. This presentation was recorded at the Donald L. Tucker Civic Center in Tallahassee. Now to introduce the program, here's Economic Club of Florida President Dominic Calabro. Welcome to the 488th in our series of distinguished speakers. Let me repeat that. 488th, and uh, Ambassador Chakab was a previous one. I don't know which number, but it was a lot earlier. <laughs> uh, I am Dominic Calabro, your club president, and very honored to serve this year as your president. Our October 10th program coming up will feature Russian businessman Nikita Ternolofov. We are holding a networking social on October 12th at my office at Florida Tax Watch, which is 106 North Bruno. Again, October 12th, the uh, program will social will be at the Tax Watch office. I think we have 60 already registered, but please uh, sign up for, um, if there's any uh, vacancies available, please contact the Economic Club of Florida's office if you'd like to be placed on the waiting list. We sent out a member survey last week and encourage each of you to complete it but only complete one survey, please. Uh, please be sure to complete the survey by this Friday so that we can have your input and again, continuously to try to improve the operations and the value of your club. I would like to thank our club sustaining members who provide additional financial support to the club each year. And if you would please stand and be recognized. Any of our sustaining members, please stand and be recognized. Keep sending in that money. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce the head table. Please hold your applause until I've introduced the entire table. Beginning on my far left and your right is uh, Ms. Patricia Shevers. She is a fourth generation Tallahassean. She taught in the public schools of Florida for nearly 25 years and retired from the Florida Department of Education. Uh, next, of course, is our speaker, Ambassador Chuck Cobb, who I'll introduce in a moment. On my far right, your left, far this is Kenneth Kent. Ken Kent is the executive director for the Florida Court Clerks and Comptrollers and has extensive experience in local government administration, project management and finance, extensive experience, not expensive, but extensive. He didn't make too many mistakes or he wouldn't be where he is today. Uh, by the way, the clerks and uh, comptrollers have a very, very complicated and important responsibility throughout Florida. Next to him is Jack Dieselhorse. Jack is a longtime friend of mine personally, but also most importantly, owner of Notary Public Underwriters. Jack is the immediate past president of Springtime Tallahassee, which provides nearly $10 million of total economic impact to our local economy. <clears throat> and Ambassador, what happened some years ago when some uh, wise senator or wise guy senator from Orlando was thinking about moving the capital to Orlando, we instituted Springtime Tallahassee <laughs> to make sure all those buildings and facilities remained here. Next to him uh, is Jessica Lowe Minor. Um, Jessica Lowe Minor is the executive director of the Institute for Nonprofit Innovation and Excellence. This is a management support organization founded to enhance the capacity and leadership of the nonprofit industry. And I'm pleased to say that Florida Tax Watch is in its number of our officers are active members of this institute. The Institute serves as a driving force for this region's economy and quality of life. Now, it gives me great honor and uh, privilege <clears throat> uh, to welcome Ambassador Chuck Cobb. Uh, we also want to thank Ash Williams, who I think will be joining us shortly after the, uh, his meeting of the trustees, Governor and Cabinet, uh, who's also been very helpful in getting uh, Ambassador Cobb here. Just to let you know his schedule is so hectic, he's going to be leaving here to go to Toronto and then to Iceland, where he has been many, many times. Chuck, uh, Ambassador Chuck Cobb is the CEO of Cobb Partners, a very successful investment firm. He has served as the United States Ambassador to Iceland during President George H.W.'s administration, and as the Undersecretary of Commerce during President Reagan's administration. He is the former Chief Executive Officer and also Chief Operating Officer of Arvida Corporation, Penn Central, Disney Development Company, Kaiser Aetna, <clears throat> Aetna, and has served on the board of nine publicly traded corporations and many, many private corporate boards. Ambassador Cobb is a 41 trustee 
and past chair of the Board of Trustees of the University of Miami, a former trustee of Stanford Business School Trust Fund, Florida's, uh, for Florida's governors, Ambassador Cobb served as governor, served Governor Jeb Bush as chair of the FTAA and chair of the Florida Council 100. For Governor Christ, he served as chair of Gateway Florida. For Governor Lawton Childs, he served as a member of the Commission on Education. For Governor Bob Graham, he served as chair of the Florida Council 100's economic transition team and personally made six economic development travel missions with Governor Askew. Chuck Cobb has also served as chair of Florida's uh, SBA Investment Advisory Council. He serves as a trustee of the Woodrow Wilson Center. We see Bob McClure as president. He serves as uh, Bob's uh, on the board of the James Madison Institute, the Council of American Ambassadors, Plymouth Congressional Church Foundation, and many other or civic organizations. Uh, he's previously served as an officer in the U.S. Navy and a member of the 1960 Olympic team. He has an, a BA and an MBA from Stanford University. And um, one of the things I did want to mention in here that <clears throat> not only is he serving, but I think what, what Chuck Cobb really has notably done is made things, good things, really, really good things happen because he's worked collaboratively, found what's best in people, best what's in our political and business leaders, brought them together to solve meaningful, real challenges and provide meaningful solutions, and didn't quit till it got done. One thing he did, I think it was right after Governor Bush got elected in 1998, beginning in 1999, as chair uh, of the Florida Council 100, he instituted what's called the Florida Five to make sure a lot of our groups, Florida Council 100, Florida Tax Watch, Associate Industries of Florida, Florida Chamber, uh, and Enterprise Florida would collaborate, particularly on a couple of really key issues, so that we could help, whether it's an educational reform, whether it's infrastructure and transportation, economic development, meaningful, wise tax reductions, but to make sure we work together to improve the governance of the Sunshine State. And when we did that, we really solved some meaningful problems and avoided some really tragic potential endeavors, such as uh, Amendment 4, hometown democracy. So he's been a doer. But he's also been blessed to have an incredible champion and uh, love of his life and business partner, and that is his wife, a former ambassador to Jamaica, Ambassador Sue Cobb, who's also been former secretary of the state of Florida and former secretary of the Lottery Department. I'm honored to present Ambassador Chuck Cobb. Thank you, Dominic. That's. Uh... That was a very nice introduction, and that, I uh, guess that dramatizes I have a difficult time holding a job from here to here to here to here. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to be back. Uh, as Dominic mentioned, uh, you were so kind to invite me here uh, 36 years ago. I was hoping you would uh, make it more frequent than every 36 years, but I'm delighted to be back, and, uh, and hopefully, Hopefully there'll be another invitation, but not so much 36 years because I'll be 116 uh, then. And, and, but I'm delighted to be back. And, and in, so uh, in 1980, when I was here, um, Dominic mentioned that, uh, that I just led as a task force for Bob Graham in putting together a white paper on economic development a year earlier. And, and by that point, we had uh, got the legislature to to pass many of the recommendations in that plan, but there still were some uh, that needed to be passed. And um, so I was here in 80 lobbying and asking you to help us with the legislature uh, on some uh, priorities. And so I'm here today to also ask your help on lobbying the legislatures on some points I'm gonna get to in a moment, which I think are high priorities for 2016. But what I thought uh, might be interesting and uh, was to give you a perspective on economic development and job creation in Florida over the last uh, many decades. Uh, and, and my punchline is going to be, I think we've really been served by some very good governors and a very good business community. Um, and, and the net result is Florida has been a leader in job creation and economic development. But let me give you a sense for that and, and, and why I think some of the lessons learned uh, should apply to 2016. So uh, 
the first governor that really was involved uh, was Ferris Bryant in uh, early uh, uh, 1960s. He, uh, he had a number of different proposals for economic development and job creation. He started the Florida Council of 100 in 1961 and, 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 and really sort of sit for the first time uh, set the course. Uh, Governor Burns and then Governor Claude Kirk kind of continued, but still Florida was not yet in the big leagues. We, were, we had so much growth from retirement spending and other things, there wasn't a, a need, of, or it wasn't a felt that there was a need for, for an economic strategy for additional job growth. We come to the early 70s and then Ruben Askew, and we actually took a step back during Ruben Askew's first term. As many of you remember, uh, Governor Askew uh, implemented a corporate income tax. We did not have one up until that point. And so that was, that was increased the cost of goods sold of, of, of companies. Florida was perceived to be less competitive. Our national ratings went down a little bit. Uh, but dramatically, in Ruben Askew's second term, he did 180 degree. He could see that we needed to do more in job growth. And so he then made a commitment with a number of different initiatives to make the state more economically competitive. He committed to, to personally uh, go to about seven or eight of the uh, important industrial job creation centers in the Northeast that were, where, where companies were considering going south and maybe even to Florida, uh, which turned out to be very successful. And then he committed to international travel, really one of the first governors to do that. And um, again, very successful. Uh, many of us committed to go on all the trips with him, and uh, which also turned out to be very good for our companies. And in my case, Arvita, uh, several different companies, international companies committed to come into our industrial parks due to the salesmanship of Ruben Askew. Uh, one of the biggest successes we had was Siemens Corp, uh, which committed to open its, uh, its, its, its offices, its, its American headquartered office in our Boca Raton Park of Commerce in Boca Raton. And uh, it was due to Ruben Askew. He did, this, he did the close in Munich with the CEO. So we were really blessed and then and then following that time, uh, uh, when President Carter became the president, he selected Ruben Askew to be his United States trade representative. And then for the rest of his life, he became one of America's biggest advocate for free trade, for business expansion, international business, uh, which was a really a, 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 a difference from his, from his earlier uh, commitments, uh, i.e. the tax, the corporate tax. Now, Florida really didn't get to be the number one in the nation until Bob Graham became uh, the governor. And I mentioned before this Council of 100 white paper that uh, we presented. He and Lieutenant Governor uh, Wayne Mixon, who I understand is a former chair of this organization, uh, fortunately implemented practically all of our initiatives. The Florida legislature uh, agreed with them. And by 1981, uh, Florida was the number one uh, state in the union, and number 82, and in 1983, three years in a row, we were the number one state in the union in terms of job creation, in terms of business climate. Now, I recognize that some of these uh, climate studies are pretty subjective, and they're not very quantitative. Uh, they're a little bit like the US News and World Report uh, rankings of uh, universities. It's a little bit uh, subjective, but it does give you a sense for, for what states are doing a good job in Florida. Clearly was in the early 80s. Unfortunately, in the later 80s, other states became more competitive. Other states really got going, and we dropped in the, it was called the uh, uh, Grant Thornton study, by the late 80s, we were, we were down about 15th or 16th, having num been number one in the, in the early 80s. Uh, Bob Martinez uh, came in 
And he recognized we need to do some things, but he unfortunately proposed this service tax on our businesses and our national ratings uh, fell off substantially with that. Uh, the, the Florida legislature did not pass it. And then Bob uh, Martinez then in, uh, fortunately had some new initiatives for job creation. One of them was picking Jeb Bush as his Secretary of Commerce, who did a, who, who did a terrific job. Uh, um, I talked to Jeb this last week and told him I was going to be commenting on his Secretary of Commerce and asked him what he thought his, his top accomplishments were. And he, he said he thought opening up Asia, where he was really one of the first um, and the governor uh, uh, to visit Asia. They opened up offices, which, which we were ahead of other states in that regard, and it's paid off uh, uh, well for us. Governor Martinez, again, did some positive things. The most significant, in my judgment, was his deci decision that was made, again, with the Council of 100, along with the Chamber and Tax Watch and others, who recommended Enterprise Florida. A, a really a radical idea of moving job creation and economic development out of the Commerce Department and creating a new public-private partnership. We were the, one of the leaders in the nation in doing this and tributes to uh, Lawton Childs for supporting that. Uh, there were a lot of his, a lot of Democrats were criticized, criticized him for that decision and it was a right decision. I am convinced Enterprise Florida has served us well, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Florida really didn't get back to the top number, near number one, almost, we were at number one one year in, until Jeb Bush uh, was then elected governor. And as all of you know, Jeb had a much broader vision of what we needed to do as a state. Um, it started with education. He was convinced that to create the kind of climate that we needed to really compete, we had to make a radical change in education. You're all familiar with what he did. You're all familiar with the results. And it has not only improved the education of our kids um, and given families greater choice um, with, with better results, it has dramatically helped in terms of job creation and economic development. Um, one of the, the strategic plan that Jeb created, uh, and, and by the way, I was a chair of his transition committee, but it didn't matter. I was, was a, a subordinate in every way. Jeb Bush knew exactly what he wanted to do. I mean, he, had, he, you know, he had thought he was going to be the governor four years earlier and, and wasn't, but this was his game plan solely, um, was then to create a number of different centers of, in, of, of influence and excellence. A, a financial center, uh, focus uh, each of our urban financial centers. A, uh, an export-import center focused on our ports and our airports. A healthcare center uh, focused primarily on bringing Latin American uh, people seeking healthcare uh, to come to the state. A space center. Um, Tourism Center, obviously, in uh, near Orlando. Uh, another one of focus of, of, of Jeb's focus was on our military bases, which we had. I mean, we just had lucked out with all these military bases. But we're about to lose them with a the process that was going on in Washington. And Jeb personally uh, got involved in that and saved all of our top military bases and the and all the benefits that that had created. Another one of Jeb's strategies was that we should be the government center of, of the hemisphere. And, and it was, and so we, that's when he created Florida FTAA. And it was, it was, and so his vision was that as uh, Belgium is to Europe and as Brussels is a city, uh, Miami would be the Brussels and, and, and Belgium is the, is the Florida, we would be the center of, of a government consolidation, be it a free trade area or whatever other consolidation that was going to evolve. Unfortunately, that didn't uh, come to pass because of, in, in, my part, in my concern, a lot of uh, 
lack of focus by the Obama administration, who've, who've been more focused on Asia, which is good, and been focused on Europe, but have neglected, in my judgment, a little bit our relations with Latin America and the Caribbean. Probably Jeb's biggest, you're probably all familiar, uh, Jeb Bush had these BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. And one of his biggest, in my judgment, was the $400 million commitment to biotech and the life sciences, the commitment to Scripps and, and, and Sanford Burnham and others. Now, some have criticized that as, quote, corporate welfare or crony capitalism. I disagree with that. There was no corporate uh, no corporation invo was involved. These are all nonprofit companies. Uh, it's also been criticism. It wasn't that successful. Uh, Sanford Burnham has now decided to exit, and the University of Florida is going to take over that biotech. But in my judgment, a new industry has been created. New jobs have been created. 25% increase in university funding has been created by this biotech initiative. Florida now is one of the leaders in biotech because of that initiative. In my judgment, it has to be expanded. Jeb was not a, a big, didn't have a big commitment to incentives, but he did believe strongly that they were focused incentives, worked, and clearly Enterprise Florida had to be uh, funded properly, and more comments on that in a moment. One of the things that didn't get done during the Bush administration was a commitment to venture capital financing. One of the things that was clear, Florida was not uh, creative in, in venture capital funding for a lot of businesses. And so there was discussion of possibly having the Florida pension plans, 100 plus billion dollars, maybe 1% of that or over a billion dollars being focused on venture capital and other growth businesses of Florida. Fortunately, in 2008, during the Charlie Chris administration, with legislative initiatives, primarily led by the legislature, a bill passed that allows 1.5% of the Florida pension fund assets to be invested in the Florida Growth Fund. And so that has, since uh, 2009 forward, we have now invested a, a little, about a half billion dollars in these businesses. And, and one of the important points, this legislation made it clear these weren't grants. These were investments for the beneficiaries of the pension fund. In other words, fiduciary rules had to apply. So the net result after seven or eight years now in this half billion dollar investment, and we're on our way now to a, a billion dollar investment, We've earned 11% compounded return on that money, and we've created 15,000 jobs, and the average of those jobs is $85,000, about twice the average of other jobs created in Florida. A roaring success. I give Charlie Chris, he's the one who signed, he wasn't a big initiator, but I give Charlie Chris the credit for, because that was done on his watch. Rick Scott. He's, as you all know, it's been his highest priority, and he certainly has done a good job. The Hertz, uh, many other successes, he's, had, he's convinced the legislature to make us more competitive on regulations, and although we still have some ways to go, we still are more competitive as a state than we were before, before Rick uh, became uh, governor. So, my quick summary of 50 years of history. As I said at the beginning, Florida's been blessed. We've had really good governors, Republican and Democrat. We've had really good legislatures, Republican and Democrat. And we have had really enlightened business leadership, which I, 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 I think we're very fortunate. And when the history of Florida's written and focused on economic development, I think it, we, it will be a good record. But we're now at a critical point, in my judgment, as we look at 2016. For the legislature to totally gut Rick Scott's recommendation of $250 million for Enterprise Florida Initiative, I think was not wise. Um, I think many of these large incentives are questionable. I think, 
I think we do not have a good enough return on investment analysis to know whether some of these incentives are good. But not funding Enterprise Florida is, I think, just really wrong. And there is a movement by the leadership in the Republican legislature to reduce Enterprise even more, and even some suggestion to eliminate Enterprise Florida. I think that would be very, very unwise. What's the net result of last year's reducing in the budget? Well, the first is we have knocked out three or four international offices. Ladies and gentlemen, international trade is the most important industry in our state today. Uh, one million jobs relating to international trade. We are the second largest to California producer of exports to the, to the world of the other states. We have 61,000 exporters that are using Enterprise Florida. And now their delivery system, their helpers in all these uh, countries that Jeb Bush started several years ago have now been eliminated in the budget, which I think is very, very unfortunate. A, a second, there's many, there's many, and I only have time to deal with two of them. So first is the closing the offices. The second is the pay of the CEO. So now they have a budget to hire a new CEO of Enterprise Florida at a budget that's less than most of the regional economic development people. And compared to um, industry standards, I am very skeptical, although they've now selected five people, I think, as the, as the candidates. In my judgment, we're not going to get a superstar to really drive Florida forward with the, with the budget that has, been, that has been created. So um, another, another point, and maybe I'm too close to this one because I led this Florida FTA effort. I was disappointed that Rick Scott vetoed the previous appropriation. Uh, this, was a, this is a very small $100,000 effort in that complemented Enterprise Florida uh, to move forward in meeting with, Enterprise Florida can't lobby foreign governments. And so Florida FTA could, or Gateway Florida could lobby excess governments, and, we, and we've lost that opportunity. Um, there is going to be some consolidation in the Americas. And right now, Panama City is ahead of, of Florida and some other, some other regions in the country, Atlanta and others are now, and Houston, have now are more aggressive in that area than, than Florida is, so I'm worried about that. Higher education is absolutely critical to our economic development. Uh, Jeb's an idea of this biotech initiative hasn't been followed through sufficiently, in my judgment, by the Board of Trustees of the, each of the universities, by the Board of Governors, by, the gov by Governor Scott and his administration and the legislature. We had a great success, and we just haven't followed it through. But a number of other high-tech areas in our universities, in my judgment, we're not getting adequate focus on and to our, to our peril. So. Uh, as I mentioned before, every 20 years or so, the Council of 100 comes up with these, as we did for Bob Graham and we did for Childs, uh, that came up with kind of important turning points. Council 100 feels it's now time to come up with another. And so we've hired Greg Swoop, who's the former um, uh, uh, Secretary of Commerce, CEO of Enterprise Florida, to help uh, the Florida Council 100 develop. And in the same spirit that Dominic mentioned, that we have the five business, we hope this will be a, 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 a total Florida business leadership initiative to convince the legislature that, that we need to properly fund these activities and, um, and do it well and get Florida back in the number one position that we've had in a high percentage of the last 50 years. So that's my recommendations as of tonight, uh, today. Um, I hope you invite me back. I hope it's not 36 uh, years later. 
and um, and I'd love to take some questions. So thanks again. Thank you, Ambassador. First question, members, Doug. Maybe go to the mic or. Ambassador, I was curious on your thoughts on what roles you might see uh, the private sector, uh, perhaps in filling some of the gaps that we may see left by the reduction of Enterprise Florida and some of the roles, whether it be corporate or association-based, uh, things like that. Well, one of, one of the things that, um, one of the debates that's going on is whether um, we should be a state focused or a regional focused. And one of the examples is that Texas, for example, just to use one of the other really successful states, has a very small group at the state level and they're all different regions, the Dallas regions, the Houston regions, Austin region, et cetera. I think we have to do one of both. So I think we have to better fund Enterprise Florida, both by government money and by private sector money. I think each of our regions has to strengthen. Uh, now, we're blessed that many of our regions uh, have higher budgets, higher paid people. You know, both Tampa, Tampa does, Orlando does, Beacon Council in Miami does. And uh, so in many ways, some are arguing that you know, the regions are doing better than the state and a lot of the success. And, and there, there's, there's some merit for that. But but uh, the private sector has to be both at the local, regional, and state level to be successful. More well, questions? Glad to have you back in Tallahassee, Ambassador. Um, Thank you, sir. I'd like your thoughts with regards to our nation's relationship and our relationship being so close to Cuba. We've had some speakers on that topic. Clearly, the president has set out a course there. We in Florida are unique in the sense that we have a lot of Cuban nationals here. But having served in foreign service, you and your wife, um, and the economic aspects of that going forward, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, uh, I think 99% of Floridians and Americans believe in the long run that United States has to have diplomatic relations with Cuba and have to trade with Cuba and it's an important trading partner, and it's, I'm not sure it's more important than a lot of our other Caribbean neighbors, but it's certainly as important. And, uh, and so it's really a question from my point of view of time, and it's a question of how do you negotiate the deal. Um, I personally, as most, uh, uh, as a, I guess a high percentage of Cuban leaders, um, including Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush and others, believe that we didn't trade hard enough. Uh, we gave up too much for what we got. Uh, and I guess that's, that's my fear. That's my, agree, that's, I guess that's my view. Um, but let's look at the long run. The long run is we have to have established relationships with them and, and and not having relationships has hurt us. It's hurt us diplomatically. It's hurt us trade-wise. And so there is, there is the benefits that we've now crossed that bridge. But did we, did we trade it? Did we get enough good? Did we did a, get a deal good enough? In my judgment, we did not. Ambassador. Yes, sir. <laughs> One of the planks of the economic platform of candidate Trump seems to be to use punitive tariffs to cajole American businesses to bring manufacturing jobs to the U.S. of A. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's disastrous. I think it is just disastrous. Um, and as his policy on, on trying to punish our NATO partners, uh, I mean, the United States uh, is a trading nation. The United States is high per capita income is based on trading. Um, and particularly, I mean, NAFTA has been a boom to our country. CAFTA has been a boom to our country. The free trade agreement with Panama has been a boom. Colombia, Peru, Chile, uh, all the Caribbean nations, the Central American nations. 
And the state that's benefited the most from that is Florida with our ports and our airports. So it's a disaster for our country. Uh, now, my, my, my judgment is that it's bravado. So when, when, when either uh, President Trump or President Clinton gets in office, they're going to recognize the reality. And, um, and so, you know, something like on Trans-Pacific Partnership, where both candidates are against it, it is so critical for our country. It's, it's important for our defense relationship. And so I'll bet anybody in the room, whatever you want to bet, the Trans-Pacific Partnership will be approved, even though we have both presidents saying they're against it. It's so important. And um, that's my judgment. Chris? Ambassador, you talked about uh, private equity involved in Florida and also the um, commercialization of IP and, and industrial property, and certainly we have centers for that. However, we don't have the infrastructure of the um, private equity firms as we have in the centers in Boston and, and California, and the infrastructure to support the um, growth of small businesses. What do you think, as we compete against tourism and real estate as our primary uh, engine drivers, when, what is the mass that will going to move that forward, that will bring those kind of industries that really are moving America going forward? So uh, Ash Williams told me that in 2009, we had something like a total industry of venture capital and small loans to, uh, to, to Florida growth companies of something like $100 million was the total Florida business. So today, today that is probably two or three billion. So we've gr grown in 10 years, maybe, you know, 20 fold. Um, and, and the small business uh, fund of the Florida Pension Fund has been, you know, close to a third or half of that growth. So, so I'm optimistic that the Florida Growth Fund is going to continue at a dramatic increase and provide a lot of funds. And the private sector is, is now following. Um, so on our, on our board, in our nine-person board, I guess we have three kind of venture capitalists that are, that are kind of new to the region. Uh, so I think we're, I think we're, I think we're making good progress there. Ambassador Cobb, yes, thank sir. you for your, uh, for your comments. Uh, want to get your perspective, 36 years from now, what do you think is the uh, greatest set of opportunities facing Florida? And what do you think is the greatest, biggest threat? Well, I think the greatest opportunity is to be, so my vision for, God, 36 years is too long. Let's think, let's think 20, 30 years. My, my vision is that we're going to be uh, the Belgium and the Brussels of the Americas. And that uh, my vision is that we're going to have, uh, um, we're going to compete with MD Anderson for health care in, in the region. We're going to compete. Um, we're going to be the banking and financial center. Uh, for the Americas. We're going to be, we're already the tourism center uh, for the Americas. Uh, we already are the space center for the Americas. So we're going to be the government center, the financial center, the health center, uh, sports center, and, um, and we're going to have a dynamic economy like um, Hong Kong or Singapore or London or uh, other major uh, Brussels or other regional worldwide centers. That's my vision for Florida. And, uh, and I sure hope we can get the legislature to understand that. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you. Back. Hopefully it won't be 36 years. Yeah. Um, I met your wife, Sue, when she was the lottery secretary. And thank you both for your public service to the citizens of, the, of Florida as well as the nation. Thank you. Um, I wanted a, just a quick comment about Enterprise Florida. Um, you mentioned that we don't have superstars on the five that are being considered. I, I didn't say that. I, I didn't say we didn't have them. I said um, what I meant to say is 
I hope there is a superstar among those five. Great. And I hope that uh, they are willing to work for less than competitive compensation uh, because Absolutely. I don't think the package is there, but I'm skeptical. That's what right. I said. Then, but, 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 but there could be a superstar in there well, uh, that's willing to work for that. And a few of us in the room have worked for Rich Biter when he was Assistant Secretary at Florida DOT. And uh, I, one of the things that, uh, the, that this governor, along with the governors that, that you served with, um, realized what the impact of what was going on in the world. And obviously the expansion of the Panama Canal was very real to Florida with Port Miami dredging to 50 feet and the Port Miami Tunnel, but um, the Florida DOT really did retool under the leadership of, of uh, Rich Biter and, and Secretary Prasad and then subsequently uh, Secretary Boxholt. But um, I just think it's, um, it is imperative, and, and you've made it very clear to us here today that we have to really understand what's going on in the world to really benefit here in Florida. And, uh, but, uh, and to your last point, how do we find good people to serve? Because the DOT secretary runs an $11 billion agency and has paid $141,000. We have to pay for talent. And um, in various parts of Florida government, uh, one that I'm familiar with is the Florida Pension Fund. I mean, we were losing people. And so fortunately, we've now created um, an incentive system that it's directly aligned to the interest of the, of the Florida pension holders. And uh, we're now able to attract, and we have attract some world-class superstars. So I think we have to do it in all the government, but particularly those public-private partnerships like Enterprise Florida. Barney. Barney, how are Mr. you? Mr. Ambassador, how are you doing, sir? Good. Um, you made a great case for defending um, Enterprise Florida, but we've got a, a, a set of circumstances coming up in which the incoming Speaker of the House and the next Speaker, which, by the way, is from Miami, your part of the state, both believe that, um, that economic development in the way that Florida is doing it is, as you indicated previously, crony capitalism that it's not producing the results. And you have a Senate that historically has been very reluctant to see it as anything other than some insider trading. And then you had the last CEO who had hired a bunch of people from Miami that came with him and he paid them high salaries for little work and stuff. And so how would you, uh, how would you address the House and the Senate with respect to saying that EFI is really something that still needs to be um, survive and become even stronger? Well, that's what I've tried to do today. So I've tried to enlist you and Bob McClure and others to say, um, to other leaders in this room, uh, I mean, we've got to convince uh, the legislative leaders that this, this is critical. And so uh, I'm hopeful this white paper by led by the Council of 100 and Gary Swoop, but joined by Tax Watch and Chamber and Associated Industries and, and others, uh, will help convince the legislature how critical this is. And, and, and it's going to get to that vision that I've just stated uh, 10 or 20 years from now. Thank you for coming this, this afternoon. I've got some of an egregious question I want to ask here. Um, I have a very limited knowledge on the Trans-Pacific, the TPA agreement that you were so much in favor of. If you can just kind of tell us just a synopsis of what this is trying to do, the main goal of it, an advantage of it, and a disadvantage of it. Good. Thank you. So uh, the advantages of the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that it, uh, we have been trying for 20 years to get agreement in, in the, in, in, uh, the, for, the World Trade Organization, which it takes, uh, it takes you know 150 countries to agree, and we cannot get. I mean, it's just too big of a body, so we can't get agreement to uh, not subsidize agriculture like to the extent that we've had. Um, you know, a cow in Switzerland gets about you know 100 dollars a year subsidy. Um, you know, it gets almost as much as a, a lot of people in the world make for, 
you know, their total salary. Um, so, we, I mean, there's so many issues. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership deals with a lot of those critical issues, deals with cyberspace issues, deals with the technology transfer relating to the digital world we live in, deals with environmental issues, deals with labor issues. A lot of these issues were not in NAFTA or CAFTA because they were just too complicated. And plus, technology didn't allow it yet. We didn't have the, the, the bandwidth to deal with a lot of these things. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership, if it gets approved, will be the standard for the world. Um, and as you probably all know, China is not part of the Trans-Pacific. So if China wants in, then trans China has to play by those new, tough, rigorous, disciplined rules. Now, in addition, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, will be uh, an important quasi-defense agreement, not quite a NATO, but, but a, a partnership of, of all the countries together surrounding China. And so supporting our friends in Japan, supporting our friends in South Korea, supporting Vietnam, um, and the rest of the players on the, on the, on the Pacific Ocean. So, um, you know, Hillary Clinton said it's the gold standard. And then uh, when Bernie got so high attacking it, then she had to turn her position. But I, I'm convinced that when she gets in, now maybe they'll make a, a little zig or a zag here, change a comma to get it approved. I'm not sure what the politics will be, but I'm convinced it's going to be approved. So I don't know if that is, does that explain why it's critical? I can give more details, but I think I, I saw some of your eyes glaze over when I do that. So I don't probably, <laughs> Ambassador, I have uh, maybe two, two questions for you. One is going to be, um, I guess uh, you know better than any in real estate, it's three rules is location, location, location. And sometimes in execution of policy, it's Execution, execution, execution. So we may have a good, f solid idea in Enterprise Florida, but it's a matter of having the right leader that fits. We had that, I think, in Gray Swoop for the most part. I think he was a tremendous, by all accounts, well-respected. Didn't quite have the legislative thing going, but he really was a champion and successful. Do you think it might well be that? That's number one. Second question, which do you consider among your private initiatives are you most proud of? Well, I'll do the, 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 the last one first. Um, uh, in Arvita, we created um, a company that has created some great communities in Boca Raton, in Weston, Sawgrass, Longboat Key, um, other places that, uh, that people really love to live in. And um, so we were one of the first in the nation uh, to do that. And, um, and, and we were some of the most successful in doing these large scale communities. So today, Weston was a field when I started. Today there's 70,000 people there and it's beautifully landscaped and it's, you know, it's just a great community. And Sawgrass the same and Boca Raton. And same. So I guess I'm, uh, my private, um, my private, that would be the thing. And what was your first question? Uh, on, on, execution. Oh, execution, yeah. So, so what I've tried to say today is I think um, uh, to get what we want to get, it's first is money. So it's money for Enterprise Florida, it's money in our university system, it's money um, in our K through 12s. I mean, but then a lot of people say, look, money's in the end. It's, it's, it's talent, yes, so, so, you know, we got to have good people. I think. And then we've got to have good laws that encourage. So um, in the area of education, I happen to believe uh, school choice and broaden the, 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 the monopoly on education to, and, and where the money follows the family and follows the child, I, I just think makes us more competitive. That's, what, that's the way business works and that's the way I think healthcare should work, which doesn't yet. That's the way I think education should work but doesn't yet. So, so 
for to get this vision, we need better laws, more money, and more talent. Yes, sir. <laughs> Ambassador, thanks for coming today. And uh, looking towards the southern hemisphere for just one minute, uh, particularly the country of Venezuela, which is now uh, almost a failed state, if it's not already a failed state. And I'm just wondering, what do you think the, uh, with, with all of its oil, oil abundance in there that we know about, what effect do you think it is having or will have on the United States in general and Florida in particular in its situation now? Yeah, that's above my pay grade. I, 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 um, I guess I think it is a failed state, and um, so we can discuss the degree of its failure. But your, but your, you know, your question really is what's what's baffling uh, leaders in the United States. I mean, what what's going to be the follow-on? You know, so we don't want an Iraq follow-on, and we don't want a Libya follow-on. Um, and so, how do we how do how do we? It's going to crash. Uh, this airplane is going to crash. How do we have it be a safe safe landing? And and. And so I just don't have, I mean, I just don't know how we're going to get a safe landing because, um, you know, Iran could help it be a bad crash and Iran could, could be, I mean, there's just lots of risks in, in Venezuela and uh, it's absolutely critical to our country and particularly to Florida that it be some sort of a smooth crash that, um, that there's survivors and and we can pick up the pieces, but it's a good question. I'd, I I don't have a really good answer on that one. Thank you, um, Ambassador. Thank you for your tremendous service to our nation and to the state of Florida and the people of Florida. As a token of our sincere appreciation for your time and your wisdom today, we'd like to present you with this limited edition bronze eagle sculpture, which we'll mail to you. <laughs> so you don't have to carry it with you. By a local and nationally recognized artist, Stanley Proctor, who's done a lot of the uh, metal work in front of the governor's mansion as well. Ambassador. So thank, thank you. you. And uh, my wife and I love eagles. Um, we have um, a couple other eagle sculptures, which we love, and I will cherish this one. Um, we have uh, just made a major gift to the Miami Zoo uh, for a live eagle, and it's going to be the Chuck and Sue Cobb uh, area at the Miami Zoo where there'll be a live, beautiful eagle. So I, next time you're in Miami, go to the zoo and see that, and uh, thank you again for this. It's mean, very meaningful. Thank you. I believe our next program, October 10th, uh, Jenny will be back at the FSU Alumni Center, is that correct? Yes. Next, October 10th, FSU Alumni Center. FSU Alumni Center. Where's it going to be held at? FSU Alumni Center. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been listening to a delayed broadcast of the Economic Club of Florida luncheon meeting of September 20th, 2016. This program was recorded at the Donald L. Tucker Civic Center in Tallahassee. Join us again next time for another Economic Club of Florida luncheon meeting on WFSU-FM.